Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is Call to War, video briefing number 16. And uh, 15, 16, 17, 18 are actually all four are connected. They are four parts of one word. Uh, if you have not watched video briefing number 15, I'm encouraging you to do so as soon as possible. It is archived on both my uh, both of my Facebook pages and also on my YouTube channel, Apostolic Iron. Uh, the uh, the focus of 15 was the eternal plan of God. The subject of today, Call of War briefing number 16, is our place in God's plan or God's will for us in his plan. And then number 17 will be uh, sin is missing the mark, and missing the mark is not fulfilling our place in his plan. And then finally, Friday is activation day. Friday is uh, the, uh, the declaration of going forward. It is uh, the beginning. In that uh, session, I will be uh, beginning the spiritual warfare, not in praying but in teaching. And the Lord has given me some things to say there that are very, very critical, including a prophecy that uh, he has given me to uh, share. I am not allowed to share it before Friday, but I will be uh, doing that in the, the noon Eastern Daylight Time session on Friday. So in uh, getting right into today's uh, subject, again, this is Call to War video briefing number 16, and uh, we, w we want to talk about the, uh, the, our place or God's plan for us in him or his plan for us uh, in his purpose, his plan, his will. Uh, his plan for us is called the will of God for us. How God relates to us and his, his plan is called his will. And yesterday, uh, in uh, video briefing number 15, I, I talked about the, the will of God, the plan, the purpose of God, starting with God's perspective and working down to us. And, and the steps of that, <clears throat> I gave the summary of that before I taught, and now today, I'm going to give the summary of God starting with us and then going up through the levels of his plan to relate to him. Uh, the following are the dimensions, uh, uh, the d different dimensions of the will of God, the progressive dimensions of the will of God, starting from us to God. So our daily walk in God is the plan and the purpose of God for a specific day, including for every uh, moment, uh, minute, and hour of our day. That's the will of God. It's the will of God for us to have that. It's the will of God for us to do that. So in every single day, we are participating in uh, the, all, the, all of the plan of God from up through every level because our way of participating with our place in God, therefore in the plan of God, in the kingdom of God, in the eternal plan of God, is by doing the will of God every day. So the first level of the will of God going from us to God uh, is our daily walk in him. So again, the plan and purpose of God for a specific day, including for every moment, minute, hour of our days of our lives. The next level of that, that all fits into the overall scheme that is our place in him. This specific overall, this is the specific overall plan of God for a, an individual's life as it pertains to God's overall plan. So each day, God has a will for my day all day long. And I have heard preachers say this, that it's incomprehensible to me that God doesn't have a plan and a purpose for you and I every moment of the day. That's why it's called walking with him. And then 
We do that day by day because I can't live in the past or in the future. I can only live today. This is the only time that I can live for God or, 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 or be a part of God and Him work, live and work through me is today, right now. But this day is a part of this life that God had planned out for each one, has planned out for each one of us where, where and how we fit into His overall will. But then each one of us individually fits in God's plan for his church. And his plan for his church is the guiding and the governing principles of God as pertaining to him being able to fulfill his plan and purpose. Because he's going to do that in the earth through the church. And then when the church is participating in the will of God, in the overall plan and purpose of God, then the church is involved with the kingdom plan. That's the overall plan of God and direction of God for his kingdom, both during this time and in the millennial kingdom and in the eternal kingdom. And all of that then fits into God's eternal plan. That's the whole plan of God that encompasses everything from before the beginning to and throughout all of eternity. So he has this eternal plan. And then he activates or operates his plan in the kingdom plan. And then to do his kingdom plan, he does it through his church. And he has a plan for the church. And then for him to do that through the church, each individual, he has a plan for them as a part of his church. And then for each individual to be a part of the plan of God, they've got to walk in the will of God every day. There are no throwaway days. There are no days that are unimportant to the will of God. It may be the will of God for me to, to, to sleep in today because he's been pushing me really hard and he knows my frame that is made of dust the earth. And there, there are times, I know there are times, he's not getting me up at four or five or six or whatever. You know, he doesn't wake, wake me up till eight. I, I don't get up till I wake up. I don't have a time I get up. I wake, I get up when I, when he wakes me up. I want him to have total control over that. So I don't, I used to berate myself when I got up at eight, but I didn't re, I wasn't acknowledging that, you know, he's God. He knows this flesh better than I do. He knows how much, what, how much rest I need. He also knows that when I wake up and he's trying to get me up and I say I'm tired, he knows that he wants me to get up then and trust him with whatever fatigue I've got. So if I want to be a part of the eternal plan, I got to be a part of the kingdom plan. To be a part of the kingdom plan, I got to be a part of the church plan. To be a part of the church plan, I've got to acknowledge his plan for my entire life. And for his, his plan for my entire life to be fulfilled, I've got to live each day walking with him. Each day is like a step in the walk of God. And he doesn't have to reveal his will for me or to me any more regularly than for each day. Sometimes he'll give you a glimpse. Sometimes he may even show you the end destination, but not tell you how you're going to get there. Because the only thing he is required by his own word to do for you and I is to give us direction for this day. For this day. So, this is a critical thing in, in a time like this. There is peace in God, but only peace in God in his will. If I'm out of his will, there is no peace. I cannot possibly have peace out of the will of God. And if I am in the will of God, I can't possibly not have peace. Because remember, we're talking about Jesus' peace. He said, my peace I leave you, not as the world I give you, not as the world gives. Because the peace of this world is only peace when there's no problems, no difficulties, no pain, no problem, no pressure. But God's peace is superior to all circumstances. And God's peace works when, uh, in spite of all circumstances, because the peace of God keeps guards is superior to all understanding and keeps guards and preserves our hearts and minds, Philippians 4 and verse 7. So 
if I'm going to have peace, I've got to do it being the will of God. If I don't, if I don't have peace, now some folks are going to lie to themselves. They've got peace when they don't. You might try that for a while, but the only way you'll have what you call peace when you're out of His will, it's not peace; it's relief. And the only way you get relief when you're out of the will of God is you sear the conscience where you don't hear from him anymore. So if I'm out of the word of God and out of the will of God and I don't feel any conviction and I think I've got peace, that's not peace. That's when God says, okay, all right, you're no longer a son and I'm no longer chastening you. Enjoy this the best it's going to get. And some delude themselves into believing that's peace when it's not peace. You can't have peace out of the will of God, and you can't be in the will of God living outside of the word of God because the word of God is the revealed will of God. So we're going to start off here at the most basic point and uh, touch on these points as we have a time in the, the, uh, the uh, remainder of this lesson. First of all, let's talk about that most basic point, and that is the daily will of God for us. The, the, uh, again, I'm going to say this. I read just the other day when, 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 when someone posted a, a, a preacher. Uh, I started to say man of God, but if this is what he's standing for, he's not. Uh, he, 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 you know, he said, somebody was asking me how to find and know the will of God. He said, God doesn't have a will for us every day. And I'm going, what you're saying is you're not concerned about the will of God in your life every day because Jesus Christ is who's supposed to be living in us, and he did nothing except it was in the will of God. That was his whole focus of the day. He sought for the will of the Father and did the will of the Father. That is the definition of his day. That's how he lived. And since Christ is in us, in order to have any hope of glory, that's the way he's going to live in us. And if that's not the way he's living in us, then the question is whether or not he is in us. So the daily will of God for us is not about keeping a rule or law. It's about choices. So if I'm doing the will of God today, I am submitted to God all of my choices today. Now, some people claim that God speaks to them about everything. That's, that's not the truth. That's not true. It doesn't happen. And if that's what you believe... I pray for you. In Jesus' name, I pray for you because you, you, you're, you're trying to use God to, to, to cause people to look at you better than you look at yourself. Because you look so badly at yourself, you got you got to claim some kind of inside track with God that he talks to you about everything. Tells you what to eat, what to put on, whatever, whatever, whatever. No, no, he doesn't do that. He gives you specifics of his will each day when by, his, by the still small voice of his spirit or other ways that he will guide you. But the majority of, day, of the day, I do what Peter said. I seek peace and pursue it. And once I have the peace of God starting out in the morning, that's when you're supposed to seek for it and pursue it, is to have the will of God. Then I follow my peace all day. Colossians 3.15, let Peace, rule in your hearts. And the word rule there means arbitrator, umpire, decision maker. And so if I have peace and I'm following my peace, peace makes my decisions. That's God communicating with me as I walk with him in peace. Now, throughout the day on occasion, I, he will speak to me about this or speak to me about that or whatever, but he doesn't speak to me every moment of every day about everything. And he doesn't do that with anybody. So if I'm going to walk in his will, I have to have peace because being in the will of God is peace. Being out of the will of God, there is no peace. So if I'm submitting myself at the beginning of each day to God and I'm humbling myself under the mighty hand of God by the grace of God, 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with verse 5 through 7, I am humbling myself under the mighty hand of God and seeking peace by casting all my cares upon him, submitting my will to him, submitting myself completely to him so that I give up control of everything to him and how every part of this day turns out. 
so that all I'm doing is walking with him in peace. And if I do that, then there is nothing that happens today that I won't have confidence that he absolutely knew about in advance and that if that's happened to me, good by our definition or bad by our definition, he knew about it in advance and he's got a purpose for it. Now, one of those really misquoted verses of the Bible is, uh, uh, yeah, that's the one right there, yeah. Uh, and, we, and we know Romans 8, 28, that happens sometimes. Uh, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And in too many people's lives, there's a period there. And what does that let them do? That lets them define what, be, what loving God means. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> if you're married, your spouse has got some kind of idea of what they think loving them is. And let me tell you where they got that from. They got that from Jesus because he's the one that defines what loving him means. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. I can say all day long I love God, but if I'm not obeying the word of God, then I don't love God according to Jesus. According to Jesus. So they stop there, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Wait, that's not the end of the verse. That verse doesn't apply to everybody. That verse is qualified. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and those that are called according to his purpose. So in order for me to have confidence that everything that happens in my life today is in the will of God, he knew about it in advance and I can have peace over it, I have got to love God by submitting myself to his authority, his word, and his will. His word is principle. The, the spirit of the Lord takes his word and applies it to my life every day. That's called the will of God. The application of the word of God by the spirit of God, directly or indirectly in my life, either by the voice of God or by pe the peace of God, is how I walk in the will of God today. Amen. And if I'm sitting at my chair in the afternoon about 4 o'clock and I get drowsy and take a nap, I'm not going to feel guilty over that if I'm walking in his will. I'm not. I'm not. Now, I'm gonna, not going to live on, uh, on, 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 the, on the Fox News app or any other news app. But there are times I know that I am directed to check that out and see what's going on. Not for the purpose of opening myself up to whatever they're preaching and propagating, whatever they're trying to disseminate, but just so I've got some idea what's going on so I can take it and give it to God. Because he doesn't call me to walk blind. It's still daytime. The night hadn't started yet. And I'm supposed to have my eyes open and see what's going on. And I've got to have my spiritual ears open and my spiritual eyes open. And my heart needs to be able to be sensitive so that it can discern not only what's going on, but what God is saying about what's going on. Now, again, the will of God for each day is about my choices or his choices, depending on which, who's going to make those decisions. If, I, if God makes those decisions for me, Again, either through his word or peace being my arbitrator, my decision maker. Again, Colossians 3.15. Or am I going to make those decisions based on what I want, what I like, uh, what I think I need, what I prefer to do, et cetera, et cetera. I can't do both of those. I can please God and do let him make the choices, or I can displease God and walk in iniquity by me making those choices. Bro, come on, brother, right? It's not like that. Really? Well, what about the greatest commandment that is not just hero is the Lord our God is one Lord, but what am I going to do with that? The rest of that first commandment is, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, with all your strength. That Greek word all there is, uh, is one of the rare used words concerned, translated all. It means the whole of or the entirety of. So you tell me how I can be loving God, obeying the first commandment, loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength if I'm not letting him make the decisions in my life. I'm not. And I got a question for you. Can the disobedient be saved? If I'm not loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength as a matter of habit, a matter of 
lifestyle, a matter of life choices. I'm a Christian, but I rake my own decisions here. Really? Really? <laughs> God has willed or chosen what pleases him. God, we choose what pleases us. But a Christian uh, who, does, who cannot do both. We will choose whose will we will follow. This is the summation of true biblical Christianity. Whose choices will I live by, God's or mine? Now, I know, I know religion has made this about do's and don'ts. Why is it that we want a, a, a set of do's and don'ts? We want a set of do's and don'ts so we can know when we've done the do's and we haven't done the don'ts. And that once we get that taken care of, then we can run the rest of our lives our way. Or those that, oh, they're against not doing the do's and not doing the don'ts. No, they don't even want to pretend they're trying to obey the, the will of God. They want, to, they want to run their own lives and actually deceive themselves into believing that's okay with God. That is deception. It is the height of deception. And the outcome of that is not going to be good. It's not. If I choose my will over God's, biblically, this is called iniquity. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth. That is not just do as an event, but doeth is a continuous action of doing the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then when I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I beg of you. These people didn't understand what they were doing and how it displeased God until they got to that day. And in that day, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works or many mighty miracles according to the Greek? Then when I profess unto them, I never knew you. That Greek word therefore know is to know in an approved relationship. I never approved of our relationship because you wanted to do these things and whatever, but you didn't want to give your whole life and your whole will to me. When God set us free from sin, he didn't set us free to live our own life our way. We were bought from one master to be under the good master. We were bought from one sin that was dictating our choices to live under God who's dictating our choices. And if you don't see Christianity like that, I'd like to know what Bible you're reading because that's clearly what the Scripture teaches. It's what the Bible teaches. I wasn't set free from sin so that I can now go and do my own thing. I was set free from sin, therefore set free from myself by his blood on the cross and his death so that I could rise to walk in newness of life. But I can't walk in newness of life unless I'm walking according to his will. So he said, depart from me. I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never approved of our relationship. Depart from me, which is a proclamation of ejection. Ye that work iniquity. And what is iniquity? It's not doing the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Doing. Not, not, it's not, I didn't, it's not a question of did or didn't. It's a question of doing or not doing the will of the Father, which is in heaven. The, what is the key to finding and knowing truth? The scripture says, uh, if I choose God's will over mine, then God is guaranteed that he will reveal truth to me. John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether it's be, I speak of myself. If I choose my will over God's, then I open the door of my heart and mind to being deceived by a lie. If I'm doing my will, living for God for God, the way I think I am willing to do that and expect him to accept that, Cain, I've opened myself up to a lie. God's going to let a spirit of delusion come to me, and I will believe that lie and be damned because I have 
I have believed the lie that I can live my way and that God loves me enough to accept me just like I am and that he's going to leave me like I am and let me live like I am. Not happening. It's not happening. Now, I agree that there are some religionists that absolutely hammer a brand new person coming and they want to just, you know, they want to clean the fish before they get him in the boat, so to speak, as the old saying is. I'm not talking about that. But God, it does not, he loves everybody just like they are, but he doesn't leave anybody like they are. And anybody that believes that they can be a child of God without change believes that Jesus lied when he said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish because the word repent means change. Change of mind, change of direction. So I can say I have faith all I want, but if there's no change in me, I don't have faith. Because if I believe God, I believe his word. I can't believe God without believing his word. If I don't believe his word, I don't believe in God. I can say all I want to say, but it's just delusion. If I don't believe God, I don't believe his word. If I don't believe his word, I don't believe God. If I'm not following his word, I'm not following God. If I'm following God, I'm following his word. And if I'm following God and his word, I'm following his will for me each day. And each one of us, there's a, the reason there's a different will of God for you and a different will of God for me is because each of us have a different place in his kingdom and he is working out that place, our place in him, doing through us what he planned to do for us each day, I'm not supposed to go do what you do. I'm not called to pastor your church or attend your church or, or lead the music in your church or whatever. No, I'm not, I'm not even called anymore to do that here in Antioch. That's not my place here anymore. I'm not the pastor of any of our works. That's not my place. It's not my place. So the will of God for me today would be different than the will of God for our three pastors here. Because each one of them has a different group of people and a different responsibility than I do. But every one of us has a will of God that's specific to us that fits in the overall plan of God for our lives. And each of us individually, that individual plan fits into the plan of God for the church. And then all the churches fit into the plan of God for the kingdom. And everything being done in the kingdom of God here fits into the overall eternal plan of God. We are called to be conduits of the will of God in the earth. Matthew 6, verse 9 says, After this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Luke eleven two. 2, he said unto them, Why, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. So the word will here is that we're supposed to be the conduit for praying into the atmosphere of the earth by the command of Jesus. In both places, when when he said, when you say, uh, when you pray, say, and then when you pray, Pray, after this manner, pray ye. Both that, both those words are in the imperative tense of command. It's not an option. If I'm in the will of God, I'm going to pray these things from somehow, some way, every day. Whether in the spirit or in the language of my mind or some of both as the Lord would lead. But it is the church of the living God and then the local churches in that geo, their geographical areas, and then the individuals that are in that church, and then each one of us individually in our day as a fitting into our life are supposed to be a conduit for the will of God to be prayed into the earth. Thayer says this word will means what one wishes or is determined shall be done of the purpose of God to bless my, mankind through Christ, of what God wishes to be done by us, the will, the choice, the inclination, the desire, the pleasure. This word is used in Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure thy will That's the Greek word there, same one that we're supposed to be praying in Matthew 6 and Luke 11. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. So let's talk about doing the will of God. Hebrews 10 talks about the fact that Jesus came to do the will of God. 
in Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What for? What purpose? The word Greek word translated that is for, for this cause, on this account, for this purpose, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Those are not three different wills of God. Just like being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost are not three different names. So the will of God is not three different wills. It's not the good will, the acceptable will, the perfect will. These are three adjectives defining the will of God. The only will of God. There's only one will of God. Now, Jesus talked about it being the will of the Father. There's only going to be one will in eternity. That's the will of the Father. And to qualify to be a part of that will in eternity, I've got to give myself daily to that will right now. Why? I am practicing living by that will that I'm going to live by for eternity. Lucifer got himself kicked out of heaven because there came a point where iniquity was found in his heart. What does that mean? There came a point when he wanted to make the decisions and not follow God's decisions. Well, let me tell you something right now. The only way any of us are going to go to heaven and stay in heaven is that we've learned to live by the will of God here. And you know, you can't be saved if you don't live by the will of God. There's no room in the eternal kingdom of God for any other will but the will of the Father. And that's why I've already read to you Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said the only one that's going to enter into the kingdom of heaven are those that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then his mother and his brethren and his sisters come one day and they said, your, your mother and your, your brethren are without. They, they want to talk to you. He said, who are my mother and my brethren? He said, he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples, this is Matthew 12, 40, 49, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever do, shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Meaning, he claims no relationship with us. It's not based on us doing the same thing he did, which is the will of of his father. And when he was praying in the garden, what was he praying about in the garden? He was not he wasn't praying to not die. He was praying to that sinless being was praying to not have to drink the cup of our sins. But every time he asked to be spared from that, let this cup pass from me, he always qualified with it with nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And the, the, one of the main purposes of having the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to be empowered by the Spirit of God, which is called grace, to be able to do what we cannot do ourselves. This is Philippians 2.13. We are empowered to do His will, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The Greek word there translated pleasure is to determine as an active option, option to choose or to prefer. It is, it is a root, it is the root word for the Greek word philema, will. So God's Spirit works in me both to activate in me, to activate my desire, my philema, my, to will, to desire, to do of His good pleasure, that which pleases Him, which is His will. You want to please God, do His will. You don't do his will, then you're not pleasing to God no matter how much you think what you're doing is acceptable to him. It's not. It's not. Our personal place in God is his will for us, for our, our lives. And then each day is a step in that walk, which is his overall plan for us. Each day is a step. And I need to faithfully, obediently, submittedly, and happily walk this step today in his will to get me to my destination. And if I'm in the body of Christ, which is the church, that will mean I will be there at the church's destination. And if the church I'm a part of is a, uh, is a part of the body of Christ, he claims, then we will be there for the destination of his kingdom, which means we're going to spend eternity 
as a part of his eternal plan. That's why the greatest commandments are, again, that we should give ourselves all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength to God. Colossians 4.12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all of the will of God. In all of the will of God. <laughs> Acts 13.22, And when he had removed him, uh, Saul, King Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also God gave testimony. We testify for God. God testifies for us and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And what's the qualification? What defines somebody that's after the heart of God? Which shall fulfill all my will. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense and reward. For ye have need of patience, that after that ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So those that are impatient, and they, they, they do the will of God, and it doesn't work, because nothing happens. Then they go on trying to figure out something else to do to make stuff happen. The will of God has five elements to it. For you and I, every day, the will of God. And any other specifics of God's will in our lives has five elements to it. Who, what, where, when, and how. And he, do, he never gives all five of those at one time. He uses the revelation of each one of those to control timing. So he usually starts out with who and what, and, and, but he doesn't tell where, when, or how. And so therefore, he uses that to get us praying, to get us thinking, to get us giving ourselves to you, him. Okay, God, I give this to you. I'm willing to do whatever. And then he re reveals these others when it's time finally for them to be done. And he doesn't always give those three in the same order. He almost always starts with who and what. You do this. But I don't go do that right then. I do, I wait till I get the revelation of where, when, and how. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. So I need patience after I've done the will of God to obtain the promise. And then 1 John 2, verse uh, 15 says, uh, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, how do I know whether or not I'm loving the world rather than the Father? And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's, that's it right there. If, if I'm doing the will of God, I'm not loving the world. If I'm loving the things of the world, I'm not loving God. And if, I, if, if I'm loving the world, even though I claim to be a Christian... If I'm walking in my own will, walking after the lust of my eye, the flesh, my lust of my eyes, and the pride of my life, my self-sufficiency, I'm running my life, I'm making my own decisions, then when the world passes away, I am too. And I'm not going to be with Jesus forever because I have not done the will of the Father. And then finally, 1 Peter chapter 2, four, four, chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, there, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. This is so critical, folks. This is so critical. <sighs> Let's, let's talk just a, go kind of a review, and we'll go forward from this review. Let's talk about, the, again, the importance of the will of God in our daily lives. The will of God is the most important thing in a Christian's daily life. And for a, for a biblical Christian, their life is really, really simple. They don't have to figure anything out. They don't have to make any complicated decisions. There's only one question that needs to be answered. Is this the will of God or is not the will of God? Because if it's the will of God, he'll tell me how, he'll tell me where, he'll tell me when, if it's the will of God. If I don't know the how, when, and where, not counting just the who and what, if I don't know the how, when, and where, then it's not the will of God or it's not the timing for the will of God. And so, therefore, 
Life is really simple as a Christian submitted to the will of God because every decision comes down to this one question. Is this the will of God or is not the will of God? Is the will of God for me to go on vacation? Yes or no? Well, guess what? Sometimes he says go. Okay, well, okay, it's his will for us to go. Where is his will of God for him to go, for us to go? And so then I follow my peace and his direction, and I don't knock down doors and make a lot happen. I, w- I watch as he directs and opens doors, and then wherever I go, I don't have to go in guilt, and I don't have to go in carnality. I can go and enjoy that time of rest and recreation for my body and soul and fellowship with my family or whoever else I'm with because I'm in the will of God. Everything that we do that is not the will of God is ultimately our will. Everything. Everything that's not the will of God is ultimately our will. Doing our will and not his will is called iniquity in the word of God. If our will does not line up to God's will, then we make ourselves adversaries of God, his plan, and his purpose. There's no middle ground here. I'm sorry. There's no middle ground. Biblically, there's no middle ground. I'm either doing the will of God or I'm not doing the will of God. And as I was raised in Pentecost all my life, it was just a given that it was accepted. You had two lives. You had a spiritual life. You had a secular life. And you did the will of God for the spiritual life. So you went to church whenever there was services. And you, you, you prayed every morning. And you read the scripture a little bit every morning. And once you paid your dues, the rest of the time is yours to run. Show me that in the book. That's a lie. That's iniquity. God never, never endorsed this separation of life into spiritual and carnal. Carnal. It's not spiritual and secular. Paul in Romans 8 calls it spiritual and carnal. And carnality is enmity with God. And carnality is a child of God running their own lives their way. Seeking for and becoming totally submitted to the will of God must be the foremost priority of any and every believer every day. But we can and must choose to seek and surrender, seek for and surrender to the will of God when he reveals it. Because God will never overpower us and never force us to surrender. Now, I've said this before. I'll say it to you again. Because of free will, you you and I have the right to decide. But when we make decisions that are outside of his will, He has all the authority he needs to not let those decisions work. In fact, he becomes the enemy of those decisions. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, 1 Peter 5, 5. What does that mean? Everything I'm in control of, he's the enemy of. Everything he's in control of, he blesses. It's that simple, really. It's that simple. So if I'm making my own decision what to preach, well, I better be a good preacher in my own humanity because he's not helping. If we're running our own church services and we're planning them all, then I sure better be a professional at doing that because he's the adversary of it. And all he has to do to be the adversary of it is just be vacant. You say, well, that's not possible. How about the Laodicean church? They were having church. They were fellowshipping. And God wasn't even present, and they didn't even know it. God has control over every, all circumstances and situations. You have control over your will to either exercise it on your own or submit it to God. But that's where the end of your autonomy is because you and I cannot make our will happen. Oh, we can try. And the most damning thing that can ever happen to us is for us to think we accomplished that. Why? Because all that does is reinforce our determination to do our own will, which becomes delusion. And once I get to delusion, there's no way to be saved. His control over situations, circumstances may effectively limit our available choices, but he has committed to never overpower us and override our right to choose. It is one thing to follow the tenets of a religion, but daily doing the will of God of the Father is completely different. 
We must never forget this. I can be obedient to the commands of God without actually surrendering the control or the decision-making of my life over to God. And so when we take the Word of God and make it into a list of religious do's and don'ts, oh yeah, there's shalls and shall not in the book. But doing the shalls and not doing the shall nots successfully is not My flesh can't get the credit for that. I can't earn that or deserve that. The only way I can successfully do the shalls and and successfully not do the shall nots is by the empowerment of God and His grace. They couldn't do it in the Old Testament. Having begun in the Spirit, Paul said to the Galatians, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So you had to submit yourself to God to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But at what point was it okay with God for you to take back over control? Never. It's never okay with him. Paul called it being bewitched, which is deceived. Having a cloud brought over your mind so that you can't see clearly anymore. You can't. So I can do the do's and not do the don'ts without being submitted to the will of God. And religion, oh, religion honors that. They honor that. The rich young ruler. Good master, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He said, why, why do you call me good? He said, go and keep all the commandments. Oh, phew, phew, I've done all those since my youth up. Oh, wait, one more thing. The scripture says, and he loved him and said, go sell everything you've got. Give it to the poor and come follow me. I, I, wait a minute. I've been doing the do's, not doing the don'ts, but I'm not willing to surrender my life to you like that. Not willing to do it. We've been given the power, right, and responsibility to make choices. But we are accountable for every choice. Right choices in the will of God, empowered by God, please God. Wrong choices made by our will as influenced by the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, and the pride of our life. They don't displease God, and they're called sin. Every single day, every single daily choice is always an exercise of our will. We cannot separate our will from our choices and our choices from our will. God will not and no one else can violate our will, our power to choose. Nobody has a right to make my choices but me and only, and I'm the only one that can decide whether or not I'm going to submit those choices to God's choices or make those choices myself. Nobody, no preacher, No church, no government, nobody has the right to overpower my choices and make my choices for me. Why? Because whether or not I make my choice to obey the will of God or not is always going to be a test of my submission to the will of God. Every action or lack of action is a product of choice. Every action or lack of action, is a product of choice. Whether we have consciously or subconsciously made that choice, we made a choice. We exercised our will. So I'm either going to submit to God. When Paul said, I die daily, how did Jesus die? Well, it wasn't the cross that is the cause of death. He died in the garden when he submitted his will. That's where the death took place. When I'm crucified with Christ, I don't have to find a cross to get myself nailed to. All I have to do is submit myself to the will of God every day and die out to my own will at the start of every day. And when I do that, then I can live by the will of God the rest of the day and I can declare myself crucified with Christ because I'm not living my life anymore. He's living his life through me. And I'm not operating by my faith anymore. The faith of the Son of God is the one that's flowing through me and being done through me. If we do our will and not the will of the Father... If we seek to please ourselves and not God in anything, we are committing iniquity. And again, I can be obedient and not be submitted to the will of God. I can obey the rule. I can obey the literal word, but my spirit is not submitted. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that cannot hear. So, God's still in the saving businesses. He's still in the hearing business of prayer. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. 
and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So if I'm living by my will, making my own choices, even if I go to church every service, maybe I even go to church on extra times. I just love to go in the building. And, 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 and even if I pay my tithes all the way down to the mint, anise, and cumin, the, 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 the minute tithe, I'm that careful. And even if I live by the strictest separations, standards of separation, and even if I obey every word that comes out of the pastor's mouth, but I run my own life, I'm living a life of iniquity. Because those things, while they all may come from the word of God, I've made them into a religion and tradition. Even though they started out as truth from God, my attitude and approach with them has now become religious tradition, which is iniquity. The challenge. What is the challenge? The challenge is self-deception. Because we desire to do our will and we justify ourselves to ourselves. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that se which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Yes, two exact verses to different places, God trying to say something to us. Our carnal mind, our flesh, our willing, our desire to self-justify becomes the method of our self-deception. And self-deception opens the door for delusion that God allows to come to us. And as long as we're self-deceived, it's still there's still possible a possibility of the of the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord to convict us and open our eyes and bring us out of that darkness and us repent and be saved and renewed to our place in the will of God. But once it becomes delusion. There's no way. The doors are all closed to God. Three times in Romans 1, progressive steps. He gave them up. He gave them over. He gave them over. And once that final time of giving over was done, in verse 28, there was no way back. Because when he gave them over that last time, he gave them over to a mind that had no longer had the ability to discern right and wrong, good and bad, the will of God and not the will of God. So they lived by their own will and convinced themselves they were absolutely doing the will of God. The Lord has a plan and a purpose for every day of our lives, including every moment, every minute, every hour. Paul concludes by the Holy Ghost, the book of Hebrews, Chapter 13, verse 20. Listen to these two verses. Now the God of peace, whose will you're walking in, I'm adding, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. This is Paul's prayer for them. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, my friend. There it is right there. Said in just one verse. This whole lesson can be summed up in just that one verse. If I would seek to, seek to understand that, seek the Holy Ghost to implement that in my life, seek to submit myself to that, surrender to that, that God would, the God of peace, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, not my sight, his sight. He's the one that defines what the will of God is. Through Jesus Christ. How do I get to that? I have to do that by surrendering my day to God. Listen to this. James chapter 4, verse 13. He compares our view of the day, our day, to his view of our day. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. That's man making his own decisions. 
None of those things in and of themselves is sin unless it's not the will of God for you to be in that city and to continue their year and buy and sell and get gain in that city that year. Then it becomes sin, not because of what you're doing, but because you're not doing the will of God. Because any time I'm not doing the will of God, I'm committing two sins. I'm someplace I'm not supposed to be doing that which he has not ordered and directed. But that also means, therefore, since I'm not God and I'm not omnipresent, there is someplace I'm supposed to be doing what he has determined I'm supposed to do that day at that time in that place. So I've, I've committed two evils here, two sins, one decision, two results. I'm doing things, I'm in the way of something else that's supposed to be the will of God in that day, and I'm not where I'm supposed to be doing the will of God. So go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that, because of this, you make your plans for the day, but you don't even know what your life is going to be like because it's just a vapor. The only thing that holds your life together, the only thing that keeps your heart beating and your lungs working and breath going in and out and your, your mind conscious is God. And I can take those gifts, those gifts he gives to every human being every day, no matter how vile or righteous they may be in him. And I can take those gifts, every breath is a gift, Every beat of my heart's a gift because I control no beats of my heart and I can't really control the need to, to breathe because I can try to hold my breath, but I got to breathe. I'm going to breathe. So I could take this life that's a gift. I didn't earn or deserve. I didn't get myself here. And I could, I could take the gifts of every breath and the gift of every heart beat of my heart and I could do with them what I want, but they're just a vapor because all of that came from God and God alone. Just a vapor. And because we're supposed to understand this, that we're not supposed to run our li own lives and make our own decisions because our life is just a vapor and we have no control over continuing to be able to breathe. Because Ecclesiastes says, no man has the power in death to retain his spirit, retain his own spirit. Nobody can keep themselves from dying. It's appointed unto man wants to die. We can't even do our own will in dying. You say, what about those that take their lives? Well, <laughs> that's a good discussion, which I'll go to later. Because if you don't think God knew when he has set the appointment that that person knew that heart, he didn't control their decisions. But if you don't think God knew in his foreknowledge that they were going to make that decision, yeah, right. For that you ought to say, if, it is, if, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. I'm going to go do this. I made this decision. I did that. All such rejoicing is evil. All such rejoicing is glorying in our iniquities of doing our will and not God's. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in, 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 in sanctification and honor. The will of God, that I abstain fornication, and I, I live in sanctification and honor. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So when I'm murmuring, complaining, I'm not doing the will of God. Because I'm saying that God's not in control. Or at least he, I'm not in his control because I won't surrender myself to him and trust him with every moment and every day. Hebrews 13, 15, 16. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, and the word communicate, there is, it's not just speaking, but is to, to, to give ourselves to others or him through us. Uh, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And then in John 17, 16 through 18, it says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether, <coughs> sorry, 
whether I, that's not Corona, uh, whether I speak of myself, he that speaketh of himself, uh, speak, seeketh not his, his, seeketh his own will, but he that seeketh his own will that sent me, sent him. I'm going to read this again. This is too important. John 17, verse 6. I was trying to keep from sneezing. Je- Jesus answered them. This is verse 16, John 7. And said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his own his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no righteous unrighteousness is in him. John 9, 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. Hello, point blank, period. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. We, we wonder why prayer doesn't work. We hear about prayer and why it works, but we pray and it doesn't work. But we're not willing to look in the Word of God and let the Word of God show us why our prayer doesn't work. Again, Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you, in us, both the will, or in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. In Jesus' name. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, and this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that if he, that he hear us, uh, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Why? Because what we desire is the will of God that we've surrendered to. So when we surrender to the will of God, God puts his will in our hearts, and then we pray and speak his will into existence as he commanded us to do in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11. Again, there is no peace outside of his will. There's only peace in his will. And what is his will? It's the will of God for all men to be saved. No one will be eternally lost by God's choice. Everyone that is eternally lost will be lost by the choice of their own will. When I make my choices outside of the will of God, no matter how harmless I consider it to be, why? I'm just going to go in this city and live there a year and I'm by myself. I know there's no church there, but I'll watch online and I'll pray every day and I'm not going to go do any bad stuff. Surely that's okay. The Lord knows I need to make a living. Really? It's a slight problem. If he didn't send you, you're out of his will. That's sin. That's iniquity. That can keep you out of heaven. In fact, ultimately, there's only one thing that keeps us out of heaven. Is iniquity because every sin is an act of his of our will. It's not the will of God for, for men to be lost. Second Timothy two and three, who uh, uh, for, uh, chapter two verse three. For this is uh, good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. Nobody is lost by the will of God. Nobody is lost by the choice of God. Everybody that goes to hell is going to go to hell because they choose chose to run their own lives and live by their own choices and not do the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Second Peter three nine, it's not the will of God. It it it's not. Uh, the Lord's not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All of us should come to repentance. Why do you think the Lord died on the cross? We've been called to obey the second commandment also. The first commandment is to give ourselves all of our, the whole of our hearts, the whole of our minds, the whole of our spirits, the whole of our strength to God. But the second commandment is this, that because he has loved us and we've received that love, we now must be his conduits. We now must be the conduits of, Lord, of the Lord. That means we've got to be willing for him to use us to see the lost saved. Well, we, look at this nice building we've got. And we've got our services announced out on the street. If they want to be saved, let them come in here and get saved. We don't want to go and, 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 and fringe on them. No, we don't want to do the will of God because the will of God is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's not just for preachers because that word 
preach the gospel to every creature there has nothing to do with the pulpit. Study it. Look at that Greek word. Look how it's used. Look at, look at all the people. He made it very clear who he was talking to. Go ye in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow, not the preacher. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out devils, they'll speak in new tongues, and so on and so forth. And you get down to the last verse, and it says, And they went everywhere and preached, and God went with them, working with them, confirming the words with signs following. Who did he go with? The believers who went everywhere proclaiming the gospel, announcing the good news, and he worked with them. Everybody. It's the will of God for us as the sons, as his sons individually and his body collectively, to be involved with him in the evangelizing of the lost. That is the will of God. If I'm not doing that, I'm out of the will of God. He, he commanded us to pray. He said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. There's a song, my, my house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? So he commanded us to pray. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would compel, thrust out, force out, out of the house, into the field the laborers into his harvest field. Uh, you know, the question isn't just, are we going? The question is, are we praying for the laborers to go? Are we preaching and declaring according to this command that they go? Because if we do, here's how we are conduit. Psalm 79, verse 11. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. Now, in the context in which this verse is written, this was spoken to God. But now, it's not spoken to God. We are the body of Christ in the earth. And now God is saying to us, let me do this through you. Let the sighing of the prisoners come before you. Now, if you spend very much time in prayer in the Spirit, the Lord is going to give you occasions, and you can't stand it very long. He's going to let your ears be open spiritually where you can hear this, what He hears every day, the sighing of the hopeless, of the helpless, of the depressed, of the hurting, of the empty those that are prisoners of their own sin and their own choices, that are locked away on hell's death row, waiting for the judgment to send them to their eternal punishment. But the scripture says, even though, according to John chapter 3, they're condemned already, the gospel, the light of God, the power of God, the love of Jesus, the grace of God, the authority of God can set them free Deliver them. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. This is our place. And no matter what, your, what his will is for your life, as a, uniquely uh, yours as a whole, ultimately, if you're going to be a part of the church, the will of God for the church is to be involved with the lost. And you can't be a part of the church without being involved with the lost. So whatever the will of God is for your life as a whole and your life every day is to be involved with the lost. And nowadays, all things to all men that by all means, all means, all means, I might win some. Text, email, Facebook, uh, phone call, FaceTime, Knock on their door. It doesn't matter. There's all these different ways that you and I today can interact with the lost that the church before us has never really had that opportunity. And we had to resort to door knocking. This church was originally built on door knocking because we didn't know anybody. We just two kids in this city. God sent here. We didn't even realize how green we were. He sent us here. 
And we went and did what he commanded us to do. The only thing I knew to do was knock on doors and invite people to church because that's a tradition I was raised with. I didn't even understand anything about home Bible studies. What a beautiful way that is to do. A lot less pressure trying to pay for a building when there's two or three of you sitting there. Because you got to have a building, because you got to have church, because you got to knock on doors. Well, I believe that church services have a place in all this, and I believe it's it's not against the Word of God to invite somebody to church, but it is not God's primary plan and purpose to use church service of an invitation evangelism as His primary way of doing that. But what does that allow us to do? That allows all the pastor with all those people sitting there every day that come and they, they keep the rules. And allows them to believe that they're saved even though they're living by their own choices every day, living in iniquity. And so we've, we've, got, to, we've got to fall back on the body doing it because the individuals won't do it as they were called to do. It wasn't the vine that produced the fruit. It was the branches that were connected to the vine that produced the fruit. And every individual branch was expected to produce fruit. Well, I don't believe that. Sorry. Sorry. You bring me your scriptures. I got mine. I got them. I can prove it. Can you disprove it? Yeah. That's the problem, see. Because this is the will of God. If Christ is in us and he came to seek and save the lost, can we be saved if we're not letting Christ still be Christ in us and through us? Can we? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How can we have hope of glory with Christ in us if we've got Christ in prison and we're not letting Christ be Christ in us? Who owns who? Do we own Christ or does he own us? Who's in charge of our lives? Who's deciding what our life is going to be used for? How we're going to spend our time? Because when I live by my will, I'm spending my time because there's no benefit spiritually out of that. But if I do the will of God, I'm investing my time and the eternal profit to the kingdom of God out of that is immeasurable. I'm going to close with this. Same word I closed with yesterday. Beware that we fall short of the expectations, the Father's expectations of our submission and participation with his will. Luke 12, verse 45. But in if the servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Cut him asunder means cut him apart from the body and whatever his place was in the body and the reward, that, uh, the eternal reward of that place in the body. He's going to cut that off from him. And now he's got a new place and a new reward and that he's going to have the portion, the same portion that the unbelievers have because he didn't do the will of the Father. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did not commit and did, did commit worthy, uh, things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. This morning, just this morning, I woke up with the Lord saying to me, I have people of mine that are going to go to hell straight from their seats of worship where they gather with the body. Because Proverbs 14, 14 says, the backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. Well, what are my ways? They're my actions based on my, the choices of my will. So the backslider in heart is the one that's running his own life, making his own choices, doing his own will, and, uh, and, 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 and total self-deception believing 
that he's okay and that God's okay with that, no matter how many abundance of scriptures there are to the contrary. Now, it's bad enough to go to hell when you never knew anything about God. From these verses alone, there would seem to be there are degrees of punishment in hell. And who is it that's going to have the worst punishment in hell? person that goes to hell straight from the seats of a place that preaches the truth, of a place where the true God is worshipped and where people have faith in God and they justify to themselves sitting on those seats, believing they're okay, even though they are living according to iniquity, a worker of iniquity, doing their will and not the Father's. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. The Lord is the supreme ruler of the universe. And the Greek's definition of the word Lord there also means the one who owns you and is is in control of your life. Look it up. So if he's your Lord, he's making the decision, he's running your life. If he's not making your decisions and running your life, then he's not your Lord, and he can't save you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today, I loose the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of conviction of sin. I I loose the, the, the sight and light from the Lord to open our eyes and let us see. I loose the grace of God upon us to empower us to to receive conviction from God and believe the word of God and to repent by the grace of God that we might be saved. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I beg of you, my brother and sister, let God open the eyes of your mind and your heart and your spirit, your soul, that you might see. And open your ears that you might hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And open your heart to perceive, receive and believe that you might repent and die out to your will and give yourself to the will of the Father. Today, starting today and every day the rest of your life. God bless you in Jesus' name. I love you, but far more important. Jesus loves you enough to have the truth spoken to you. Amen.